Happy Friday, everyone. As has been true every week for this year, it's been an exciting week in the world of artificial intelligence and the fourth industrial revolution. So today's breakdown is going to cover five main topics. Uh, OpenAI, they've got a new announcement regarding making their own chips as well as caching in a stateful API. We'll unpack that in just a moment. I've also got some news about the global AI arms race heating up. There's been some really interesting developments, and I'll do a uh, kind of a deep dive analysis on that so that you kind of understand the trends that I'm seeing and that I'm paying attention to that uh, cause me a little bit of concern. Uh, there's been some breakthrough research on senescent cells, so this is a longevity topic. Uh, we've also had some more AI breakthroughs talking with animals, so I'll uh, unpack that a little bit. And then finally, we will talk about ongoing job destruction around the world due to artificial intelligence. So first up is uh, OpenAI working on uh, possibly building their own chips. Now, one thing is, uh, I read the article, is even if they do start making their own chips, it will take a little while, uh, whether they're designing it or setting up their own fabs. They've also looked at potentially acquiring companies in order to uh, kind of get a jump start on creating their own AI chips. Now, this is nothing new. This is what's called vertical integration. And this is actually one of uh, one of the, it's not an innovation. It's nothing, it's nothing that is like unique or anything, but vertical integration has become much more popular in the tech space, particularly after uh, people seeing the success of Tesla and SpaceX. So what you might not realize is one of the reasons that spaceflight is so incredibly expensive is because of enormous uh, supply lines and you know parts being made all over the place. And so one of the things that Elon Musk did in terms of making SpaceX cheaper is vertical integration. So vertical integration means that uh, rather than buying a part uh, from outside of the company, you build it all in-house. And so this makes sense. This actually kind of runs contrary to business theory and business philosophy, particularly in the 70s and 80s as, uh, as logistics became more sophisticated. It, it was more about outsourcing. And so instead of outsourcing, now we're insourcing and onshoring. Uh, so this, this move doesn't surprise me. And I suspect that uh, as these uh, resources become more and more commoditized, uh, we're basically going to eventually see AI chips just like any other processor, which is actually why companies like IBM sold off their entire server and laptop unit because computers are, are seen as commodities now. So moving forward uh, and directly relevant to this is the global AI arms race. So this news was, it's a little bit understated, but to me, uh, this move by some Southeast Asian com uh, countries Really, um, it kind of, I'm, I'm not saying that this is a warning shot. It's not a shot across the bow. Um, this is just, it kind of makes sense. So the TLDR here is that uh, the, the ASEAN, the AS, ASEAN uh, nations, which is kind of like the EU, but for Southeast Asia, not exactly one for one, but you get the idea. Um, the idea here is that they are taking a more business-friendly, kind of more libertarian approach to AI regulation. So that's the hands-off regulation, uh, which runs very contrary to what the EU is doing. And of course, like there's been some pushback against the EU AI Act because it was uh, it was pretty strict in terms of consumer protections. I tend to agree with that. However, in the grand scheme of things, you know, yes, uh, with global economics, you can use sanctions and other diplomatic things in order to try and coerce uh, other nations or other blocks of nations into uh, cooperating. But in the grand scheme of things, this is a global scale game of geopolitical, economic, scientific, and technological chess. And the writings on the wall, as everyone knows today, at least almost everyone knows and agrees, uh, obviously there's some holdouts, but in general, it is understood that the countries and companies that move fastest and furthest on AI will have a distinct advantage, not just economically, but socially and militarily. So there is no incentive for countries to slow down. And this is what I and others have been saying since the, the infamous pause letter came out. What was it, almost six months ago already? Seems like yesterday. Um, but, you know, and it's like we knew that that was a failed idea. Like you cannot slow this down. 
um, and you know, private enterprise, they're going to do what's in their best interest. Militaries are going to do what's in their best interest. Governments are going to do what's in their best interest. So it's basically like, you know, strap in, get ready for blast off. We are all along for the ride. When this is actually a big component of my research, because my assertion, as other people uh, are coming to realize, is you can't stop this. You can't have some high-minded ideal like uh, what some of the CEOs are saying like, oh, well, we should never make it agentic or, you know, we should do this, that, or that. No, you have to assume that this is a uh, an imperfect environment, a highly competitive environment where basically anything goes. And so in that case, basically you're stuck in what I call terminal race condition, which is you're trying to optimize for speed as much as anything else. And as other people call it a race for the bottom, it's not necessarily a race for the bottom because there are also advantages to being smart and ethical. The smarter and more ethical your AI is, the more trustworthy it is and the less oversight it requires. I've talked about this in some of my recent videos where putting effort into lying and being deceptive, that is all wasted effort in my opinion. So uh, pay attention to how uh, things play out between, you know, a it seems like the, the the three primary centers of gravity for AI is America, Europe, and Asia, uh, which, of course, like, that's most of the world. I'm just excluding, like, the global south uh, from that. But anyways, point being is that um, this is a really interesting development. It's not surprising, but it is still concerning, and it's something to watch. Uh, more specifically, uh, as you may or may not remember, earlier this year, the Biden administration placed a pretty heavy... Uh, trade embargo uh, on AI chips going to China. And there has, this is, again, it's not too surprising, but there's been some pushback from the big uh, silicon uh, players, uh, NVIDIA, Intel, and Qualcomm. They're pushing back on that now because they're saying, uh, you know, well, here, let me just get, give you the summary first. Uh, cutting sales to China, obviously, if you can't sell to someone, that's bad for business. This is part of the globalist policy that's been in the place since uh, the 1970s and 1980s which is uh, you know, economic interdependence, uh, reduces your chances of going to war with people because if they have goods that they buy from you and goods that you buy from them, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. And so trade embargoes, particularly with gigantic trading partners like between America and China, generally it's a lose-lose situation, but you do that for geopolitical and military reasons. Uh, now, another thing is uh, and the, uh, this is actually kind of surprising because some people predicted this. And of course, China is incredibly adaptive. So like, I think it was like literally within days of the embargo being announced, China uh, internally announced that they were going to say, okay, well, we're just, we'll just develop our in own internal expertise, our own internal fabric, uh, you know, chip fabs, and we won't need you. So they're like, take a hike. We don't care. Um, so you know, there's there's many possible unintended consequences and intended consequences from the uh, chip embargo going to China. But, you know, basically, <laughs> if you cut someone off and then they have to develop their own internal expertise, that is a chance for them to then kind of say, well, we don't need you anyways. However, uh, despite, uh, you know, so for instance, uh, what I'm one thing that I'm thinking about is a few years ago, Vladimir Putin in Russia said, you know, the company or the country that, you know, dominates AI will dominate the world, something like that. I'm, I'm, I know I'm misquoting it. Uh, but basically, despite knowing the value of that and despite having literally hundreds of billions of dollars um, to invest, Russia was never able to develop the internal expertise to catch up or compete on the global stage with respect to artificial intelligence. Now, that being said, China is far more organized and far richer than Russia. So if they set their mind to it, it's entirely possible that, yeah, cutting off trade with China means that they're just going to have their own little isolated island of AI expertise. And it, it, in the worst case scenario, it will be like a new Cold War where, you know, the Soviets were developing science and technology independent of and parallel to the West uh, and, and, and so this, there's actually a lot of people that are predicting that we might end up in, in like segmented internet world again, um, which that would be interesting one way or another. I'm not, I don't actually know whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing until we learn to come together as a global species. One of my long-term goals is to, uh, is to help steer humanity towards utopia. And part of what I view as utopia, obviously there's different, uh, definitions of this, but I think we can all generally agree that like world peace is a good idea. 
Um, and part of part of world peace is open communication. So I I think that segmented internet and and having you know different different uh, hemispheres of the world having fundamentally different approaches to artificial intelligence and AI and internet would probably be a bad thing in the long run. Okay, so moving right along, this news comes I think uh, yesterday or, or the day before, and I didn't pay too much attention to it at first. But uh, some of my some of my Patreon supporters were talking about it, and so I gave it a second look, and it's it's a, it's kind of interesting. But unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of news yet. But what OpenAI is teasing is that at their upcoming developer conference, they're going to introduce what they're calling a stateful API, which could lower the cost of using the the, the ChatGPT API as much as twenty times, like so twenty fold reduction in cost. So they haven't released the details yet, but um, in reading about it and talking with with people, it looks like it's some form of caching, um, so that that way, like it 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 maintains the conversation state. Now I don't know if that just means that it records the text of the conversation, or if maybe they found an, a more efficient way of reducing costs, which maybe it just records the embedding, because uh, for those that don't know, the way that Chat GPT works internally. Is it the there's the there's the it's a transformer architecture. So on the input side, it creates an embedding, and that embedding is I think it's a twelve thousand uh, dimension vector that just it's a semantic representation that says, hey, here's here's where the conversation is at. But you don't need you know walls and walls of text. It's all recorded in the embedding. And so if that's what they're doing, which is what I suspect they're doing. In that case, all you have to do is record an embedding and say the conversation state was at this. You don't need all the text. You don't need to re-embed that vector every time. Instead, what you do is you split the model in half. So, And the, who knows, maybe it is split in half internally where they've got the embedding side and then the decoder side or the encoder and decoder side. Um, and so then the stateful API might just say, okay, here's a UUID connecting to this embedding. So all you have to do is refer to this UUID and you can carry on the conversation from wherever you left off. If I were them, that's how I'd approach this. But as a uh, infrastructure engineer and global solutions architect um, at other tech companies, that's how I'd approach it in terms of uh, both increasing performance, because if all you have to do is sideload a vector rather than embed an entire thing, that'll be faster, but it'll also be much cheaper because you're, it, it comes down to watts. Every watt you have to spend um, redoing and embedding is wasted energy. So, you know, reduce, 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 just cut down on any excess. Like, so one rule of thumb that I have whenever I'm doing automation work is process something once. Um, if you can process something and then record it, um, if the act of recording is cheaper um, to, to uh, energetically speaking and time speaking, then that's going to be more efficient. And so I've often talked about how you know, whenever people ask me, like, Dave, how do I get around this limitation or how do I reduce costs? My my <laughs> response to all of my clients and, and everyone who asked me is just wait, because chat GPT-4 is like 10 times cheaper than GPT-3 was a year or two ago. And a year or two from now, it'll be 10 times or in this case, 20 times cheaper. Uh, and so you get these compounding returns where, you know, like it, you, it, instead of exponential growth, it's exponential decay. So, you know, the cost per token used to be 10 cents. Now it's four cents. Soon it'll be one cent. Then it'll be, you know, basically trivial cost before too long, uh, especially as, you know, uh, the chips get better, the models get leaner and more efficient, uh, and other efficiencies are found, not just necessarily in the model, but in the rest of the software architecture and training and all that stuff. So uh, pay attention to this space. I, uh, this is why I wanted to include this, though, is just like, just wait. You know, you'll you'll see 10x drops in cost, 20x drops in cost. Eventually, you'll see 100,000 x drops in cost. And of course, every time that these models get smarter, cheaper, faster, better, safer, that also makes them a greater threat to jobs, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Okay, so this is super exciting. I mentioned this on LinkedIn, and I, I made a previous video about it. But the ACE framework, uh, the Autonomous Cognitive Entity Framework paper, is live on Archive. It is officially published and released. Obviously, Archive is a preprint server. Um, this hasn't been to conference yet to, you know, to be peer-reviewed or anything. But my open source team um, is, we just finished the first sprint on, on building a proof of concept. So actual code applied at this. 
we had a we had a demo day yesterday. It was an internal demo day, and we learned a lot. We shared a lot of notes. We recorded it. Um, so we're working on a highlight reel from that demo day. But yeah, so this is really exciting. The code is happening. One of the most important things, and I'm not going to like rehash everything, but the most important takeaway from the team conversation yesterday, which was a two-hour conversation, um, was that there are no technical barriers to progress. Everything that we're trying to do and everything that we need the models to do, they are capable of doing. All of the all of the infrastructure that's underpinning the architecture, all of the vector search databases, all of the message queues, like literally all the pieces are there. We just have to assemble it and we have to do some of the prompt engineering, figure out the meta prompting strategies, figure out the communication between the layers. Um, but this stands in stark contrast to my earlier work on cognitive architectures where GPT-3 was good. It just wasn't good enough. Even with fine tuning, it just wasn't smart enough. The context window wasn't big enough. But but particularly GPT-3.5 Turbo and GPT-4, these models are smart enough and they're good enough. And also I had a few friends uh, join the team who are uh, experts in open source models. So that was actually one of the biggest, most consistent comments and requests both in the comments in the previous video and discussions on the uh, GitHub, which is now that people are seeing that cognitive architecture and autonomous agents are eminently possible, there's a tremendous amount of interest in getting this over to open source uh, for numerous reasons, not the least of which is just more control over the models. But we've also seen some recent um, studies and demonstrations that you can get really good performance out of very small models. I think the most recent one was that a 7 billion parameter model outperformed a 70 billion parameter model. And so when you have models that are that small, you can run them locally. And that is better for privacy. It's better for safety and security. And there's all sorts of reasons that this is better. Now, obviously, these frontier, these flagship models like GPT-4, they're the smartest and most powerful, but the open source space is actually accelerating. So you might remember at the beginning of this year, six to 12 months ago, uh, where people were like, oh yeah, open source is good, but it's a year or two behind. Now open source is only a couple of weeks to a couple of months behind these frontier models. Uh, which is really exciting. And it's good news for us, but it also goes back to what I was talking about where the genie is out of the bottle. Like we cannot contain AI. It is impossible to, to even try and contain it. So don't bother. Instead, what we need to do is align it and make it autonomous and, and safe and trustworthy so that uh, it aligns with us and we align with it. And um, that's my opinion, obviously. So that's, uh, that's it for the ACE framework. I do have a couple really small announcements before we get to the rest of the video. First, I've got a new Substack. I'm moving away from Medium because uh, a lot of people complained that Medium was paywalled, and I was like, no, it's not. Um, but I realized that um, I actually don't know how Medium works because some things are paywalled and some things aren't, and it doesn't ask me. Um, so anyways, I'm moving away from Medium to Substack. Um, link in the description. I also just activated channel membership, so I'm still working that out. But uh, at, the, at the very baseline level, uh, if you become a YouTube channel member, your comments get top priority. You get a set of unique, uh, cool emojis. I, I made those by hand, uh, well, by hand with Dolly. Uh, and you also get some, some uh, unique uh, Raven badges. Uh, also, I've got books, merch, and a little bit more coming soon. Um, so I'm working on a systems thinking book on my other channel, my NeuroSpicy channel. My systems thinking series is by far the most popular series of videos. So I'm going to make a whole book uh, teaching you how to think like I do. Um, and then I've also got a sci-fi, uh, right now it's a duology, but it might be a trilogy that I'm working on. I've, I've been referring to this for a while. Um, there's also going to be some four IR swag. We've got, uh, like some, some mugs and stuff that we're working on, um, probably some t-shirts and other stuff. There's going to be exclusive offers to my Patreon supporters, Substack subscribers and channel members, as well as some early access to this stuff. And of course, I've also got the uh, exclusive Discord where we talk about neurospicy stuff and AI and uh, existential coping. The uh, the existential coping thread is is one of the most popular threads. Anyways, my goal remains the same: is I want to maximize the chance of success of humanity, not just surviving but thriving in the future. So literally everything that I do is based on grassroots support. So I really appreciate everyone who uh, chimes in, chips in, whatever way that you can, like, subscribe, comment or support me on any of these other platforms. All right, back to the show. So job destruction is something that I talk about a lot. I talk about post-labor economics, where basically the, the, the central idea of post-labor economics is that uh, getting rid of humans from the workforce is a good thing. 
um, and that we should actively work to automate away the need for human labor because it is the greatest constraint on uh, progress and productivity. Now, that being said, that represents a very fundamental uh, paradigm shift in terms of how we even think about economics. So I'm always keen to pay attention to um, news and evidence of uh, AI destroying jobs because the thing is, is right now, there's no evidence that AI is creating new jobs. Sure, we've had uh, comments from from various CEOs saying, oh, we're not going to fire anybody. But then it's like, yeah, you, like, but you have a hiring freeze and you just laid off 7,000 people and you created only 1,000 new job openings. So even if you're, you're saying that AI is, quote, creating new jobs, it's creating far fewer than it's destroying. That is, of course, what it seems like is happening now. So in this case, this was another example where it seems like the, the, the lowest hanging fruit for AI to replace is obviously uh, graphic artists have been greatly harmed by uh, image generators. The Hollywood writer strike just ended recently. So AI, you know, for writing. So basically creativity was the first thing. The second thing seems to be CSR, customer service representative jobs, are the next on the chopping block in terms of uh, victims of the AI thing. Now, honestly, like, when you think about it, a CSR is kind of like a telephone operator. And, of course, telephone operators went out of uh, uh, work decades ago. So, and I'm not, obviously, like, what a CSR does is much more sophisticated than what a telephone operator does. But because it is such a narrowly constrained and defined job, um, I think that's what makes it very vulnerable to uh, total automation. Because once you have voice and once you have conversational ability, there's a whole bunch of jobs that are just eminently going to go away. And you look at the progress of like OpenAI Whisper and Eleven Labs with voice synthesis. You can even have face-to-face -face conversations with fully digital avatars or what I call metahumans. So a metahuman is a facsimile. It is a copy without an original. So uh, metahumans are probably the creepiest thing. So what I, and we've already seen this actually with um, influencers and creators and YouTube personalities that like they look like real people, but they were never real people. And you've probably seen it referred to as like fake humans. I call it metahumans um, to be a little bit more specific. But the idea is that we are creating AI in our own image, which says a whole bunch of stuff about our deep unconscious psychology and Freudian stuff, which you know, I'm not going to get lost down that rabbit hole. Anyways, long story short, uh, <laughs> kind of got carried away there, uh, is that uh, job destruction is coming. And I still haven't seen any evidence of job creation from AI, at least not any substantive uh, job creation. If you have, please let me know in the comments because I'm happy to follow up um, on, on that kind of stuff. So, but yeah. Uh, last or second to last is animal communication. So this has been kind of a, a recurring uh, theme this year where AI is more and more being used to communicate with dolphins or at least decipher what things like dolphins and whales are saying. Uh, as well as the chirps of like, um, what was it? Not Was it field rodents or field mice or something like that? Anyways, we are getting better and better at using artificial intelligence in order to understand the communication of animals. And the thing is, the most important thing here is what the ability to communicate implies about consciousness and sentience. I remember watching uh, a, a documentary about Coco the gorilla who was able, she was able to use sign language in order to express desires and emotions and wants. And there was, maybe there is still controversy, but I remember at the time there was a lot of controversy saying, oh, well, this isn't communication. She's not actually expressing unique thoughts. She's just matching some behavior to uh, getting something that she wants instrumentally. She knew how to ask for berries. She knew how to say, like, you know, want water. But uh, I read the book um, Language Instinct by Steven Pinker, and as a language expert, he un he debunked like that pushback against Coco like wasn't actually sentient or whatever, because she was able to express emotions. When she heard that Robin Williams had died and she had met Robin Williams, she said that she she signed cry and something else. I don't remember, but like she had an emotive expression. Um, and then there was another, uh, there, the funniest instance was um, she got upset and ripped her sink off the wall and then blamed her kitten. So the ability of a, of a, of a, of a gorilla to do something to understand that there would be consequences and then to lie about it. So this is, this is an animal that is not human but has the ability to deceive. So that implies a lot about cognition 
Um, which, you know, I've, <laughs> I've recently done videos about AI being able to deceive us. Whether or not it's deliberate and intentional is another question. Uh, but anyways, I think that what we will come to find as we communicate with animals more and more is that our definition and our understanding of consciousness and sentience is going to expand a lot. Obviously, there's many, many of you uh, in my audience that already understand this and believe that uh, consciousness and sentience is far more broad spectrum than just humans. But there are also plenty of people who make an argument that consciousness and sentient, it, sentience is exclusively a human thing. Um, let me know in the comments where you, where you fall on that spectrum. Maybe I'll run a poll later. Uh, I'm not really sure. And finally, last but not least, is research on synolytic cells. So uh, obviously this is a little bit different from artificial intelligence, but longevity is a huge topic here uh, in the fourth industrial revolution. And so if you're not aware what a synolytic cell is, it's basically just an old cell. But what happens is, I watched a full documentary on this so I can tell you a little bit more about the key thing that's going on here. Synolytic cells are old, and what they do is they start broadcasting inflammation signals. And so these inflammation signals basically say, I'm old and crotchety, like ugh, we're slowly dying. And what we have found is that if you just get rid of synolytic cells, the organism as a whole, um, is, I don't know if they live longer, but they're certainly healthier. And so just by getting rid of these little, like, old geriatric cells that are broadcasting uh, inflammation signals, these reactive oxygen species, uh, then the overall organism becomes healthier and more uh, rejuvenated. So this is one component of aging. It is not, it's not a complete solution to aging, but it's like, okay, well, you add synolytic break, uh, you know, treatments with, you know, a few other, like maybe telomere regeneration and a few other, you know, uh, aspects. It's entirely possible that this will become one component of a full package of rejuvenation therapies in the long run. And the reason that I included this is because I have seen so many articles about synolytic cell uh, targeting this year. So this seems like it's kind of the next uh, most eminent frontier. So I wouldn't be surprised if within the next year or two, and maybe it's already here, um, but people working on uh, getting FDA approval for synolytic drugs that will basically you take a drug and your body's inflammation uh, score goes down and you age much, much slower. We'll see if that's uh, how it plays out. So anyways, thanks for watching. Let me know how you like this format. Uh, people tend to like how I do deep dives on things and unpack stuff and kind of tell you what it means. Um, obviously, there's plenty of other channels that do news, um, but I think let me know if you like my particular take on it, and um, yeah, I'll adjust accordingly. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.